Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of high-fidelity black metal, looking at some black metal tracks where the production is a little bit higher quality than some of the lo-fi stuff we've heard in the past. Today we're going to be listening to a band called Thantifaxath, which is just way too many dominant syllables next to each other. There really is no clean way for that to roll off the tongue. Uh, the track is The Bright White Nothing at the End of the Tunnel. Let's dive in and see what they're bringing to the table. Alright, so we got a three pulse going on. I really like the way the guitar and bass are playing off of each other's lines there. Our phrases right here, which is interesting because the intro and the verse are four. Seven bar phrases. This is wild. The rising and falling in the two guitars. Man, 
those base kicks just going. Very interesting using bends here to achieve an element of microtonality. In that final moment, we were doing 13 beat phrases. Uh, I felt it as 3 3 3 4. But I think you could make. You could make an argument that it was 5 4 4. I don't know how to feel about this track. <laughs> There's a lot of really cool things going on in it. Um, yeah, I guess let's just start with one of the things I really enjoyed was their use of ascending and descending lines. We heard it in several sections. Uh, the first time we heard it, I think the right guitar was playing like a two bar phrase where they descend on eighth notes and then when they hit the third bar, it jumps back up. But I think it comes back up a little higher than we started. So our, our starting point is always a, a little higher than we had. So our lowest point is always a little higher. So it feels like we're descending and then rising a bit and then descending and then rising a bit and then descending and rising a bit. So we're still climbing. We're still ascending uh, on a macro level, but on a micro level, when we look at just the idea itself, uh, of the two bar idea, we are we have this, this descent going on, <clears throat> and that is paired against the left guitar, which is doing half note ascensions. So, for I think it's every four notes on our right, we are going up one note on our left, and it just keeps rising and rising and rising and rising and rising. And I hope I'm not confusing because this is my left, but it is. It looks like right to you. <laughs> um, sometimes I mentally remember to reverse it so it looks right on camera, but <laughs> I didn't this time. But yeah, so it just continues to rise though. And we keep getting higher and higher notes until they become very shrill and ear piercing. And it's this um, idea where there is definitely upward momentum on both sides, but what we actually hear for most of it, moment to moment, is one side going up and one side going down. And it's a very disorienting moment of the song. And I think it works. We're going to get to the lyrics, but kind of based off of the title, I'm kind of 
gonna guess that this is sort of the moment when you move from dying to being dead. And this song sort of encapsulates that brief moment and stretches it out to seven minutes. It kind of explores a hypothetical take on what that might be like. That's kind of what I get out of the song. So being confused and dizzied in a sense, not knowing if you're rising or falling, kind of works with that. Now, this isn't the only moment that we have elements of rising and falling either. There is one moment that's a couple minutes after this where we have varying speeds of descent from all three string instruments, both guitars and the bass. They're all moving at different speeds, though. Much like the previous example, the right pan guitar is descending on eighth notes. So every half of a beat, they're changing a note. The bass, if I remember correctly, no, the bass was doing whole notes. So the left guitar was doing quarter notes. So every beat, they're descending one. So they're falling at half the speed of the right guitar. And the bass is doing it on whole notes, which means for every two quarter notes of the left guitar or every four eighth notes of the right guitar, they are descending one note. So it's half of what the left guitar is doing and a quarter of what the right guitar is doing. And this varying speed descent where you can hear everything falling, but you don't really know how fast any of it is because it all just kind of blends together into these various dropping of pitches. It's a fascinating sort of idea that to me feels like a loss of time. We understand what is happening, but just not how fast it's happening. Time has kind of lost all meaning. And it's, uh, it's just really interesting to hear how they can take the same concept and warp it around in different ways to achieve different contexts. Um, and this idea of, of uh, rising and falling don't just exist in these two moments. There are several times where a descending or ascending line is played as counterpoint to something more rhythmic or a chordal that another guitar is doing. Uh, those moments didn't really speak out to me as musically embodying any sort of specific concept or emotion, but I do want to point it out that at least in this song uh, particularly, maybe it is just kind of their MO. It's something they like to put into a lot of their music. Um, there is a lot more descending and ascending lines linearly. I should point that out, linearly ascending and descending lines than I typically hear in most music. Melody tends to like to jump around, not, you know, move stepwise in a, in a very specific direction. Um, so it is, it's an aspect that, that stood out to me that I really enjoyed. Um, speaking of, though, as well, I want to touch on some of the bass work here. Because I think it's very interesting. A lot of the bass work we've checked out this week with Black Metal Week kind of falls in line with Black Metal bass work, which is just to play a note a lot and really fast. Sometimes just as fast as the guitars are tremolo picking, sometimes half as fast. It really depends on the tone. And this is something that kind of, it's going to bleed into a little bit of production here, but bass tones, for me, are kind of a difficult range of notes to play quickly because it, it gets muddy. It's very easy for repeated lower end notes to sort of become this muddy mess of just sound rather than individual hits. And this is where clean production of bass tones come in. If uh, you notice when we checked out uh, First Fragment, some technical death metal had a super clean bass tone, which was very, you know, greatly required for the specific style of bass they were going for and the way they wanted that to sound. They wanted these precise, um, distinct hits, no matter how fast the bass was being played. So you need a clean production to make sure that there's not a lot of trail off, that your attacks are very sharp, um, and that it doesn't, that the notes don't bleed, bleed together and blend together into a singular sound. But black metal's production as a whole is not clean. 
it's not really the sound it goes for. Clean black metal isn't really black metal anymore. <laughs> As I discussed yesterday, that kind of what I'm looking for in this week might not really exist. However, I do think that this is some of the closest stuff to what I was expecting. We'll get into that in a little bit later. So, uh, you know, where all this comes from, though, is, you know, I'm talking about the bass, and I have really enjoy some of the bass lines that are going on. They're not your typical black metal constantly, uh, you know, playing the same note. Uh, kind of doing the tremolo picking on bass, or most likely what I've heard in a few songs is half speed tremolo picking. So if uh, the guitarists are doing 16th notes, the bass does 8th notes, because... The less attacks, the less they have to bleed together, and black metal uses dirtier mixes, which has more uh, of a chance for bass tones to just kind of meld into a single tone. And that's where I was going with all that. <laughs> uh, but here we hear some interesting lines. There's a lot of movement to the bass work here. There's a lot of movement to all of the instrumentation here, actually. Very rarely do they stay on a single note. There are moments where it happens, but it's not... It's not really the norm, and I think that's interesting because we still have the tremolo picking of black metal, we just don't have the slower moving melodic elements. And I think the bass area, uh, or the bass guitar is, is one of the key aspects to looking at this. There's a lot of movement to it. And you know, bass in a lot of rock and metal typically sits around one note per bar. It plays the root of the chord. And so for for black metal to have a bass line that moves around a lot, to me, it kind of stands out. Maybe it's not as abnormal as I think it is, but at least with the black metal I've been exposed to, this is sort of a rarity. This is something that caught my ear. And I really appreciate this attention to the bass. I feel like it's an overlooked instrument in a lot of rock and metal. And... Uh, you know, like I said, black metal, I think it's just kind of the last place I would expect some really interesting bass lines. So I love it. it. It kind of carries the melody in some places, typically alongside the guitars. It never has a moment to shine by itself, but it does uh, provide a type of counterpoint occasionally, and I, I like that. Now, there's a lot of black metal elements to this. They're just utilized in different ways. So, to me, black metal composition is a lot of attacks, right? There's some other elements to it. Uh, you know, there's production elements, there's lyrical elements, there's uh, visual elements, the, the way people present themselves on stage, um, or even in their album artwork or, you know, band photos and stuff like that. But on the composition side, at least, it's attacks lots of attacks it's aggression it's weight and that's certainly here we have double bass kicks for a large amount of this uh, track um, doing 16th notes we have tremolo picking doing 16th notes and there's certainly a bit of weightiness to the overall sound it's a very oppressive sound there's there's grit and distortion to it so all the components to black metal are here, but this one leans a bit more on melody outside of, well, I was going to say outside of the vocal work, which is typically where we see melody, but in black metal, the melody always comes from the guitars. I really haven't heard black metal with clean vocals yet. I don't think so. Anyways, if we have checked that out, let me know, you know, correct me if I'm wrong there. But, um, so we have melody lines coming from all three guitars. Now granted these aren't exceptionally strong beautiful flowing melody lines and that's kind of the point if they were they wouldn't be black metal lines uh, but we still have movement and direction and flow and alteration of pitch frequent alteration of pitch in, se in several of these sections that feels like melodic black metal which is a term that I've only just picked up this week I really yeah I really shouldn't put it past any genre to have standard subgenres right blackened melodic technical prog those are four 
subgenres or adjectives that I think pretty much every genre has a variant of. Uh, but it never really crossed my mind to think of melodic black metal. Uh, and we've checked out some of that this this week. And I'm kind of warming up to it. And I think this is a really strong candidate for that as well. Assuming I understand the task properly. <laughs> I understand the definition of it. There's a lot of mel melodic components to this. This song does rely on the texture of black metal. But... It also incorporates elements of uh, moving notes, right? Not just staying on a single note and working in the atmosphere of what that note is bringing, but moving that note around and seeing what kind of stories we can tell by changing pitch with this tremolo picking 16th note concept that black metal is, you know, that I kind of attribute to black metal. And this might be the bridge I need. Because I've spoken about in the past that I'm not a huge fan of textural music. It has its time and place. There's definitely moments where I enjoy it. I haven't quite figured out the pattern to why I enjoy specific bands that are primarily textural and why I don't for others. But for the most part, when I'm listening to music casually, I'm kind of there for the melodic components, the harmonic components, the chordal components, everything dealing with um, moving notes and note relationships. And a lot of, I don't want to say a lot of metal, there is definitely a large side of metal that is very textural. It's about the way it feels, very rule of cool. You know, if it sounds cool to stay on this note and it's, it makes that texture and that atmosphere that you want out of this section, go for it. We'll ride this note for a while. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say that that's the wrong way to make music. I especially don't want to say that's the wrong way to make metal. There's a, a huge, probably like 50-50 you know, for, for metal, whether it's melodic or textural. It's just not typically... For me, and black metal, at least what I've been introduced to, especially looking at some of the older stuff, is very textural. It's not so much about the notes themselves, but the sound that you're creating with the notes. And if that sound doesn't change when you change notes, there might not be a reason to change the notes. You just kind of stick on the same note and play it 65 times in a row. And, uh, you know, you're happy with that and your listeners are happy with that. And again, I don't want to look down on that at all. It's just not what I usually come to music for. So to find music that utilizes this black metal texture with the constant attacks and the sort of fuzziness in the production and pair that with strong melodic components... I really appreciate that, you know, and it might be what I need to listen to to get into the sound, to have that one uh, familiar aspect, the melodic component, for me to find a home within the sound of black metal, and then I can approach the sound of it uh, from a place of familiarity rather than feeling sort of alien within it, which is typically how I how I hear black metal. It's it's just very different. I, I have very little to latch on to, uh, both that I understand and enjoy. And this is something that's helped me with many bands in the past. It's that one style of song or that one song or that one band that takes something that I don't really get or don't enjoy and pair it with something that I do and allows me to hear the things I'm not used to in the context of things that I am. And this isn't the first band that's done it. We also checked out another band this week and I wish I could remember which one it was. I can't remember if it was Wolves in the Throne Room or if it was Dissection. Um, but one of them was, oh, you know what? Wolves was atmospheric, so it was dissection. Yeah, Wolves was the atmospheric one. And, you know, I, I asked, you know, is this even black metal? And it's because they went so far into the melodic component that it, to me, didn't really feel like black metal anymore. I kind of put it in the black metal camp because I don't know where else to put it. But there's still a part of me that thinks it doesn't sound like black metal 
And this band still sounds like black metal to me, undeniably. I would not put this in any other genre, but there's also this very strong melodic component to it that feels familiar to me. It doesn't feel like black metal, but it's a small portion of it rather than the overall song. Um, so I guess we should talk a little bit about the production here because it is informing some of the things I feel about this song. Um, the guitars have a bit of fuzz to them, right? They're not clean electrics. Uh, it's not like a solo guitar in, uh, I don't even know, any other genre, <laughs> <laughs> where they kind of clean it up a little bit so that they can uh, play lead melody lines rather than getting the grit out of uh, some chords. Um, you know, it's it's still a bit of a dirty sound, right? The vocals are very harsh, and there's an extra layer of compression and static put on top of them, and then they're even kind of lowered down a bit in the volume and pushed down into the mix, sort of sitting in between everything. The bass kicks are loud and booming and also a bit dry, very standard for black metal. They don't have a lot of the reverberance. It's more of that initial punch. And the same goes for the rest of the kit. Bit of a dry production on it that kind of goes with more of the oomph and less of the ah. That's a weird way to to think about it, but I mean, it kind of works. <laughs> My brain goes to genius places sometimes, but yeah. You get the initial crack, and then the reverb, the oomph, and then the ah. Uh, am I genius for that, or is that just dumb? Or is that cringy? I don't know. <laughs> I really like it, though. Uh, yeah, so we get we get the dryness in the drums, um, and the, the vocals are, are gritty, the guitars are gritty. The bass is a bit cleaner. It, it does have this nice warmth, warm roundness to it, but... You know, it's just a hair bit gritty as well. It can't be completely clean. And it's pushed down into the mix a little bit. It's hard to pick out at times. Especially when the vocals are going. When the vocals aren't going, double bass kicks are not going as fast as they can. The bass is a lot easier to hear. But I feel like it gets muddied up a little bit with the other lower end stuff around it. Um, so, you know, our production is very black metal, right? I'd even say that the fuzz and static are... Um, utilized heavily in here it's not like they're kind of hidden um they're they're just very prominent but there's excellent use of the sound sphere the guitars are panned very far away from each other not just being panned left and right but kind of having some distance they don't feel like they're right next to my ear they feel like they're a little bit further away there's there's some space between me and the instruments the growls, the drums, and the bass are all center panned, and they're all on the bit of the lower end, so it, like I said, does kind of cover things up at times. The bass is hard to hear when everything else is going, but there's a nice distinction, at least, between the lower end stuff and the higher end stuff. Uh, and, you know, especially when we're getting the, uh, the three-way descending idea, having the drum center, the two guitars on the side, everything can be heard very clearly. Very cleanly I can distinctly hear each of the these instruments and what they're doing but there's still this level of fuzz the static around all of it it still has that stark bleakness to it and I think this is very close to what I was expecting when we started this week it still feels and sounds very black metal in the composition and in the production however I can individually hear everything. I can hear the notes that are being played. I can hear each instrument. I can hear what each instrument is doing. And uh, yeah, it's it's a it's higher. I, I I mean I guess you know I say high fi production. I, I've I've already gone over it this week. I don't want to dive too much into this, but. You know, that's a very subjective term, and I think coming into this week, I should have been a bit more clear about my intentions of what I meant by that. Hi-fi hi production could mean different things to different people, and this is exactly what I wanted out of it, what I kind of call hi-fi production, is cleanliness and separation, use of the sound sphere, you know. Uh, we listened to uh, Frank Zappa yesterday. 
every instrument was clearly played. You could hear every one of them, even in the chaotic sections. Um, wide use of the sound sphere, different instruments were placed all throughout. It wasn't just hard pans, um, left and right and center. They were kind of placed to the front and to the right, to the front to the left, a little higher, a little lower. We had panning elements in the organ. And like I said, every instrument was sharp and crystal clear. To me, that is high quality production where everything has its place, everything can be heard, and there is a complete use of all of the space of the song. And that's what I was expecting coming in here. The black metal playing with great use of space and clarity of instrumentation. Um, but as I mentioned yesterday, I think those things kind of are at ends with each other. I think this is really the closest you can get to that before you either get to something that doesn't sound like black metal or becomes a little too unclear. It begins to lose that high quality production. Um, you're going to go one way or the other. Black metal is dirty and gritty and fuzzy. I talked about this yesterday. Uh, you know, the beauty of dirtiness, right? That is what a lot of black metal uses. Cleanliness is the opposite of that. And that cleanliness is kind of a good word for how I envision high quality production. So I'm... <laughs> In another way, I was asking for something impossible this week. I was asking for clean, dirty songs. What is that? And I wish I could have conveyed that a little better at the beginning. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, I do appreciate the trip that we've been on so far. Uh, you know, the three tracks this week have all been very different, have given me different views on new ideas of black metal. You know, we've checked out melodic, we've checked out atmospheric. Uh, you know, I've heard black metal with different productions and different instrumentation. I've heard some experimentation in the genre. I mean, it's been a good week regardless. So I'm not dissatisfied with how it's gone down at all. And I mean, we've, <laughs> we've consistently had like 40, 50, 60 minute videos with excellent discussion in the comments as well. So definitely a good week. But... I do think I was asking for something very close to impossible. And I'm actually surprised we found something with Thantafaxas. That's <laughs> such a hard name to say. Um, that, to me, I think is hi-fi black metal. Even if it's not as hi-fi as I'm expecting, or as that I would want, at least at the beginning of the week, I do think it, it hits this really nice middle ground between keeping that grittiness of black metal and some of the cleanliness of higher quality product higher fidelity production i don't want to say high quality right quality is, is a different thing fidelity though i think is a subjective term or sorry is an objective term it is uh it's about the clarity fidelity is clarity i think that uh that that's a that's a much better way to say than high quality because there's actually a lot of work and quality control that goes into making lo-fi music. Like there's some specific ways it needs to be done. It's not something you can just sloppily put together. It's not low quality. It's low fidelity, low clarity. All right, so I guess this is where we're gonna dive into the lyrics. And I did real good yesterday, having the lyrics pulled up already. And today I have begun to fail at that. So luckily, uh, I got these uh, these quick searches in here. So we got uh, desperate, dreaming up feelings, dreaming up thoughts, forgotten purpose, forgotten name, nightmares connected to chains, chains that drag me all over the earth, dreaming up death, dreaming up birth. I think I'm spot on with this. <laughs> this is kind of cryptic, not going to lie. And I might be coming at this from the wrong angle. Not approaching it entirely on its own terms, but trying to find ways that tie into what I already thought the song was. But coming from the idea that this is somebody on their deathbed. Uh, and they are dying, and they are just about to, and at some point in this song, do pass away. They, they cross that threshold. Uh, this is what's going on to them. You know, they see the bright white. They see the white light, they're going towards it, and uh, it's the light at the end of the tunnel kind of vibe, you know? So he says desperate, right? And I'm sure, depending on the situation, 
this might be the part where people begin to bargain with whatever you know people doctors deities whatever i'll i'll do whatever if you save me you know if you keep me alive kind of thing dreaming up feelings and dreaming up thoughts these are very interesting uh, sort of visual phenomenons, you know, dreaming up a feeling. What, what does that mean? It's it's kind of odd, but I kind of get the gist of it. Like, I don't know if I can explain it. Dreaming up thoughts, dreaming up feelings. This is sort of what I think it would be like <laughs> to uh, to be on your deathbed. You know, your brain's sort of half here and half gone. And so... It feels like you're sleeping, feels like you're awake, you got these feelings, you got these thoughts, you don't know where they sit. Are they real? Are they dreamt? Uh, you know, the, the whole perception of reality in the self must be in a very strange limbo at this moment in someone's life. It says, I've forgotten my purpose, forgotten my name. Nightmares connected to chains that drag me all over the earth, dreaming up death, dreaming up birth. And I completely see this as the stereotypical my life flash before my eyes, right? And maybe in this person's case, I don't know if this is a concept album. Oh, it's track one. So <laughs> there is no previous context for this, even if it is. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea of your life flashing before your eyes and maybe sometimes those are positive. People see the highlights. Maybe sometimes people see the negatives, these are the nightmares. And it feeds into this idea of dreaming. It says dreaming up death, dreaming up birth. So the end of your life, the beginning of your life, everything in between. Distractions created by motion and light. Distraction is all that's left. Reversal of self, reversal of light, reversal of hope is all that is left. Interesting. Interesting. So there's definitely this, uh, well, I mean, the going back to the title, the bright white nothing at the end, at the end of the bright white nothing at the end of the tunnel, you know, kind of going back to the stark bleakness of black metal, this kind of ties into a bit of uh, acceptance that there's nothing on the other side, right? It's uh, it takes the idea of the white light or the bright light at the end of the tunnel as something that you need to go to, you know, to get out of the darkness, to move on to the next uh, part of your adventure, you know, the afterlife or, you know, whatever your beliefs may be. But at least in this area, we've, we've put in the nothingness. It doesn't exist. There is no whiteness. There's no white light, right? And I think that's the main thing, you know, go into the light. But this is the bright white nothing not the bright white light the bright white nothing so you know it's kind of taking the old analogy of saying you know you have to get past the threshold to move into the next phase but this is sort of an acknowledgement that there is no next phase so this is somebody on their deathbed ready to be come nothing to just reach a point of non-existence the reversal of self the reversal of light and hope, very human things, is all that is left. So, to become not yourself, to become not light, and to be and to lose the hope, to lose the things that make you human are the only things left in this process. It says, in this womb I am bleeding, bleeding to death, tendrils escaping vines growing out of your chest, Deeper and deeper forward, drowning in rivers of concrete and ash. I'm lost. <laughs> I thought I had a pretty strong hold on this. And, and this whole uh, visual came out of nowhere. I mean, it, it, it seems like he's referencing a new birth of a type, but he's bleeding to death in this birth. Tendrils escaping vines growing out of your chest. Deeper, forever drowning in rivers of concrete and ash. Yep, these metaphors right over my head. I would dream of crowds, lights, and buildings, of cities and vast highways, this dream that I am something more than the panic thoughts of a dying universe. So cold, so vast, nothing, no sleep, no dream, cannot wake. Yeah, so... I mean, it's interesting, he 
it could be taken two ways with this idea of the dying universe. We can look at ourself as a universe, right? Our bodies are combinations of vast, tiny things, right? We have larger bodies in our organs and muscles and, you know, the bigger components of our body. But there's also a lot of bacteria and microbes and, and just tiny things existing in our body. And in a sense, we can look at ourselves as universes, not so much as the space universe, but as a metaphor like that, an analogy to uh, a, a bunch of space where it seems almost impossible for one thing at the top, so you know, a, a, a tiny microbe at the top of your body to ever reach anything in the foot. Like the journey is just so vast. There's so much space between them. Um, and they're made up of so many tiny things, like each little individual element of your body is sort of insignificant by itself, but definitely makes up a larger component, or makes up uh, the pieces that make up the larger component, which is yourself. Um, so the panicking thoughts of a dying universe. Um, so yeah, he, he says he dreams of all these things, but they don't mean anything. You know, the life flashing before your eyes is something that some people don't even believe really happens. It's just your brain trying to figure out what's going on as the synapses are beginning to not fire anymore and your brain is slowly turning off. These are the panicked thoughts of a dying universe. And once you actually pass to the other side, there is nothing. There is no afterlife waiting for you. You reach a point of non-existence, which I don't know what that feels like, but... I think this kind of covers it. It's cold, it's vast, it's nothing. There's no sleeping, there's no dreaming, and you cannot wake. And I love that right there. You cannot wake from your not sleeping, right? In our reality, the way we perceive things, the way our words work, you have to be sleeping to wake up. Waking up is a state of not sleeping anymore. But here, we talk about a, a state of being where we're not sleeping but we can't wake up despite the fact we're not sleeping it's contradictory in the way we understand our reality our plane of existence our element of existence that being in a state of non-existence would not actually make sense and i love how it seems contradictory in that way but it also kind of feels right and i do think that that's what that's what this song is about and it makes sense with some of the elements going on in the music, the confusion, the constant falling, the time feeling like it stood still, like you can see what's going on, but you can't see the frame of time that it's happening in. Uh, you know, all of this kind of fits with passing from one state to the next, and I'm sure there's a lot of confusion there, especially for people who have lived a while. And I'm not even talking like 50, 60, 90, 100 years. You know, even just living 20 years, you have a pretty strong grasp of what it means to exist and you have zero grasp of what it means to not exist. And the moment that you transfer from one state to the next is probably a very confusing moment. And I like how that confusion is both here in the lyrics. There's a lot of contradictory, confusing words and phrases. Uh, and there's just this uh, this interesting way of viewing things. Uh, really cool analogies in here. And it lines up beautifully with the music. So, I think I did pretty good with this one. <laughs> this is where you guys come in. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you thought of this track. Let me know if you thought I was pretty accurate with this. Or maybe you have some authorial intent. You've seen an interview. Or you are a member of this band and you want to let me know I got everything wrong <laughs> or I got everything right I don't know let me know in the comments above that is a description box in there is a link for Linktree which will take you to this menu right here it has everything related to the channel you can pick up some merch you can join the patreon and vote on future themes and songs you can join the discord community follow me on twitter submit special selections a bunch of stuff go ahead and check it out above that if you could like subscribe and ring the bell all right, that wraps it up for this one. We do have another special selection, or another video. It is a special selection. It launched 15 minutes ago. Go ahead and check that out. It's uh, 
I don't know what it is, but it looks like it's metal plus at least a choir, maybe an orchestra. I don't know. It sounds interesting. I'm always down for stuff like that. Um, the band's called Satyricon. I'm super stoked. If that's not your jam, though, I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC, as usual. We'll be looking at our final, yeah, our final black metal track for the week, and we'll check out a creator request, which is where a band gets in contact with me and asks me to check out their work. It's usually smaller bands, up and coming, st- uh, you know, up and coming bands, uh, very new music, and uh, always some really cool stuff to check out. These these new bands popping up, they're uh, they're quite talented. I really love it. So you might want to check that out too if you're interested in finding out what is on the cutting edge of new music. Till next time, remember to be critical but not cynical of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Mm-hmm.